Nate Marchand, Personal Journal. This morning I entered the KIJU studio 30 minutes before I had to go live for a new episode of MIFV. My laptop bag was slung over my shoulder, a half-full kaiju energy drink in one hand and several oversized kaiju film books in the other. To my surprise, Jimmy stood by the door to his producer booth. Hey Jimmy, Kevin the Dapper Man should be here soon. In the meantime, I have some last-second research on Monster Zero to do. Fantastic! I've been looking forward to this episode for months! I bet you have Mr. Nick Adams as my spirit animal. You forgot Mr. I was trained by Glenn at NASA. Yeah, yeah, just don't drool so much thinking about Kumi Mizuno that you forget to do your job. Oh, I'd never miss an opportunity to riff you. I couldn't roll my eyes enough at that. Thanks, Joel. Oh, by the way, if Michael tries to call again to demand to be the co-host for today's episode, tell him I don't care if he's already on the island, he's been on the show plenty, and is slated to be on plenty more later. Oh, I already have some choice words prepared for him. To quote Captain Kirk, you've earned your pay for the week. And Winter just gave me a raise, too. Just watch for attached strings. We can't become his puppets. Hey, <laughs> after my run-in with the Piccola, I'm not letting anyone string me up. The Pinocchio aliens Ultraman Taro dealt with? Tell me that story later. We have a show to do. Oh, uh, speaking of later, um, after work, can, uh... Can you come to my garage? I, uh, have something you need to see. Oh? What's that? Remember how Winter promised me an important museum piece for my garage? Yeah. It arrived last night. Cool. What is it? Who is you writers are fond of saying I'd rather show you than tell you. All right. But first, we have your favorite Godzilla film to discuss. For once, something I want to talk about. With that, I gave Jimmy a fist bump and walked into the broadcast room to wait for the Dapper Man. Little did I know what earth-shattering revelations I'd see after work. End journal entry. Live from the KIJU studios in beautiful Ogasawara, this is The Monster Island Film Vault, Episode 71, Invasion of Astro Monster, featuring the Dapper Man. Hello, Kaiju lovers, and welcome to The Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast seeking entertainment and enlightenment through tokusatsu. I am your host, Monster Island's media master, Nate Marchand. No, Jimmy, the title is not going to my head. How dare you say that? Oh, gee, gee whiz, man. Okay. I mean, you need to be nice to me, all right? We're talking about your favorite Godzilla film. Yes, I know. Nick Adams is your spirit animal, and you you were trained by Glenn, and you've got the biggest crush ever on Kumi Mizuno. I get it, all right, man? Well, you know, I get it. Anyway, for this momentous occasion... I had to have a momentous guest. He is the co-host of The Bottom Shelf, everyone's favorite angry Irishman, Kevin Joshua Burnham, a.k.a. the YouTuber, The Dapper Man. Hey, what's up? <laughs> hey, Kevin. <laughs> hey, um, you know what? Did you know that Spider-Man only has 11 months? Has something about him losing May. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, we're, we're starting the puns early. I approve. <laughs> Good. I just want to make sure everyone knew about that. Spoiler. Uh, puns are encouraged here. <laughs> Jimmy and I have the, the appropriate sound bites <laughs> for them. <laughs> well, it's nice to see Jamie on here, too. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I I am quite dapper. Uh, oh yes, you are. All, you're always very well dressed. I mean, it's part of the name, right? <laughs> Has to be. Has to be. Yeah, yeah. So, did you actually wear the suit all the way here uh, during your trip, or did you do a little quick change? I figured I had to look very nice for this um, podcast episode because somehow I've won a boat through a dance off contest, and <laughs> yeah, then I just somehow feel as in the back of my head i don't know it's like a headache or something and i oh. woke up 
I got the boat and I'm in this nice suit, but I'm just wondering how did I get here? I wonder if someone dropped something in my drink and I all remember is dancing and now I'm here. Oh, I don't wow. Know what. What's going on? Yeah, and that's uh, hopefully that doesn't happen to me. I'm in the ballroom dance. So, you know, the <laughs> last thing I need is some, uh, you know, a little something, something getting slipped in my drink. <laughs> yes, Jimmy. Note to self. Don't drink a thing while dancing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to take that advice next time. Yeah, mm. for sure. For sure. You want to go uh, hang out at Nessie's Brasserie after we're done here? You know, hopefully you'll get a drink that doesn't have something in it. Yeah, I'll stick with Walter. Yeah, yeah, probably. Harrier sounds idea. grand. Yeah, yeah actually, you know what? <laughs> Screw Nessie's b- Brasserie. There are better places to go hang out here on the island. I don't like the manager at, at Nessie's Brasserie. We have history. Speaking of guys getting drunk, just saying. But he's <laughs> he's not Irish, though. He's uh, he's half Scottish. So not oh. quite the same thing. Those. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Uh, uh, I I could tell you have opinions about the Scots. <laughs> How about we just move from there? And I, I know you, there's movies here, right? Yeah. Yes, and we're watching something. Right? Uh, yes, yes, we are watching something. We are watching Invasion of Astro Monster, aka Monster Zero, or if you are of a certain age, it was Godzilla versus Monster Zero. What's wrong? Can I pick a title or something? I don't know, but it was originally when released stateside, Monster Zero, but when released in Britain, it was Invasion of Astro Monster, and then I guess Toho just decided, hey, that sounds like a great international title, even though more people call it Monster Zero. Sounds like something an American Hollywood actor would do, changing his name multiple times to get into the blockbuster. Yeah, hmm. yeah, or you know, certain music artists. Formerly known as Prince. Sting. Mm-hmm. Five for Fighting. Yeah. Why do you call it Five for Fighting? That's the weirdest name for one I, person. I don't know. That sounds like a martial arts movie to be <laughs> <laughs> That five finger death punch. I mean <laughs> Yeah. So what's the fives? <laughs> five deadly venoms. I mean <laughs> Interesting. I've seen Kung Fu movies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yes. Yes, the 1965 Godzilla film, which was actually one of three co-productions with Henry G. Saperstein, who likened himself to Godzilla's American agent. He was a big fan. And so he struck a deal with Toho, him and his production company, and they made three movies together. This was the second of those. The first one was Frankenstein Conquers the World, which has been covered previously on this podcast. I had my friend... Travis Alexander on for that one. And he also, the third one was its pseudo sequel, sort of, War of the Gargantuas. Have you seen either one of those? Which has also been covered on the podcast, I might add. War of the Gargantuas? I have seen the, was it the Frankenstein Conquers the World? Yes. I haven't seen that one yet. Wasn't that, that was a German one, wasn't it? Or German (laughs) slash Japanese? I can't remember. No, it is. No, well, every monster in Germany is Frankenstein. But no, this is one that is an actual Japanese film with Frankenstein in it. <laughs> no, I have not seen that one. Yeah, it at has, least ba- not has Baragon in it. You know, you know, Baragon, the little, you know, the monster with the big old horn. And he likes the big. Yeah. Yep. You can still track down the media. Is it Media Blasters? Yeah, it's Media Blasters. The Media Blasters DVD of it, and it's not exorbitant anymore. So then it cost me sixty dollars or a blood thirty. Um, oh, okay, yeah, yep. yeah, sure. You can buy. It. I'll send affordable. you the. I'll send you the Amazon link when we're done, and you can you know pick that one up. That DVD actually has three different editions of it uh, for it because there are different endings. Yeah, I like a simple story with multiple endings. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about Monster Zero. I'm just going to call it Monster Zero just because that's the title I know it best under. I hope you don't care. <laughs> no, I don't care because, I mean, I always remember it as Godzilla versus Monster Zero, but it's Monster Zero or King Ghidra or Invasion, you know, all those other freaking names. So, yeah. 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 Monster Zero, I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's just easier that way. And if not for the fact that Invasion of Astro Monster is the official English title, I probably would have just used Monster Zero in the title of the <laughs> episode. So whatever on that one. So get us all up to speed, Mr. Dapper Man. What's going on in this movie? Somehow I have this DVD right beside me. Oh, it's like it's like I took you to the film vault before we started. 
wait, what? Did you drag me from there? <laughs> huh. Oh yeah, okay. I had to because you didn't want to. You didn't want to leave. You're just like this is heaven for me. <laughs> yeah, I probably did because it's it's the to, one um, movie collection bigger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know somewhere back in that. Was it that Geek Planet I was from? Planet Geekery? Bottoms. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's that, that, that's yeah. that thing with their dumpster. I'm so used yeah. to hanging around the dumpster, and right now it's, yeah, it's kind I'm of relieved. So sorry. It's relieved to. Oh, don't be sorry. Thank you. I mean, screw John Hari. Uh, I mean, I mean, I love John Hari. <laughs> I, I absolutely love my bottom self career. Why would I hate anyone there? I have to work with Jimmy, so I understand. <laughs> oh, calm down, man. The things you've put me through. And that's just the stuff that gets on the air. The shenanigans we get into, man. I'm, just, I'm telling you. Hmm. So here we go. Let me see. In the back of this DVD, let's see what this movie's about. Aliens from Planet X borrow our monsters for a little extermination project. But they've got something else up their sleeves. World domination. Using mind control technology, these vinyl and sunglasses wearing spacemen turn Godzilla, Rodan, and King Ghidorah loose in Japan, demanding Earth surrender. It's up to American astronaut... F. Glenn, his galaxy trotting buddy Fuji, and nerdy inventor Tetsu. Tetsu. I don't speak Japanese, man. To break the aliens' hold on the monsters and save our planet from certain doom. Invasion of Astro Monster 1965 represents the pinnacle of Toho's monster cinema with an all star class featuring Nick Adams, Akira Takarada, the original cousin. Oh, it was the original cousin? Yes. Huh. Of amazing retro riffic special effects. Presented its original, uncut, Japanese language edition. Ooh, we get to watch the Japanese edition. Yes. Yes, we did. All right. <laughs> Which has Nick Adams dubbed over. Really? Yep. So I'm good to hear his awesome American deep accent that he gives off. I remember him from the Twilight Zone. No, the Twilight Zone. Was Outer Limits Outer episode. Outer Limits. Yeah. What, what was it called? It was something like Playing Games. or Yes. Man, he was fighting monsters in that too. Yeah, he's always has monsters around him. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's. Well, I remember seeing the American version so many times because I've always watched it mm -hmm. dubbed because that's all they had it on VHS, mm -hmm. and that's all they've ever had it on DVD. But it's nice to see this DVD actually have a Japanese version. So mm -hmm. it's the same length. Let me see. It is the same length, huh? Mm -hmm. I wonder what they had different. It must be the wording or something. No, it's two minutes longer. Hmm. Yeah. It is two minutes longer. It's a little, it's just some slight edits here and there. The big thing is that they, you know, they dubbed all of the Japanese actors, but they didn't dub Nick Adams. That is. So but this it's, one is dubbed. Yeah, it's kind of, I, I, that's a good place to start here because normally we here on the Film Vault, we prioritize the original Japanese versions over the dub versions. Monster Zero is one of those ones where I can't really decide because on one hand, I get to hear most of the cast's original performance in the Japanese, but I don't get to hear Nick Adams' original performance. He's, he's dubbed over, but then it's the inverse if you watch the dub version so you can hear Nick Adams' original performance, but not everybody else's. I wish there was a super cut. I th I've heard rumor that there is a super cut out there made by a fan that is the original Japanese audio and Nick Adams' original audio. So it's very Final Wars at that point. Hmm. I would like to see that. I would as well, because I feel like that would be... It wouldn't quite make sense, but like I said, they did it in Final Wars. No one really talks about that. You know, it's like, how does why. anyone understand each other? No one cares. It's just like in Star Wars, everyone just speaks whatever language they want and everyone understands each other magically. <laughs> is, that how, is that what you do with Mr. Jimmy over there? Yeah, a little bit because his mic is broken. <laughs> okay, fine. I get it. You're going to replace it soon. Hopefully you won't sound like a robot anymore on the air because you know, only Kevin and I can understand you right now. <laughs> At least it doesn't sound like he has a dirty mouth for now. Oh, oh well. <laughs> he does let me tell you <laughs> i'm sure you've been around some irishmen that can uh, cut some blue streaks you should hear jimmy 
Yeah, most of the time you don't even understand what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I've I've tried like, watching. Uh, it's kind of like watching Mad Max without subtitles, even though everyone's speaking uh, English. <laughs> it's like I don't know if that man was cursing me or blessing me. <laughs> Maybe it's a both. <laughs> <laughs> if it's uh, if he's an Irishman, it probably is both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so so we're going to go watch this movie. Yes, let's go watch it right now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> mm. All right. <sighs> yeah, I understood everything I said. Good thing. Thank, thank God for subtitles. Yes, yes. Thank God for sub. Thank Godzilla for subtitles. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. I regret nothing anyway. So Yeah. Uh, I never knew Nick Adams spoke such perfect Japanese oh, ever. Obviously. Yeah. I mean he yeah. must have been he must have been fluent. I mean Yeah, and, because it was so fluent, everything I, I was able to understand came right out of his lips like it looked like he actually spoke Japanese mm-hmm. and not a single word of English. Oh yeah. For sure. <laughs> you should have heard about some of the stuff that his co-stars were teaching him how to say in Japanese when he didn't know a lick of what he was saying. You know what? I have to say, now that I've watched this one, they interacted actually very well with each other, even though he was, you know, as an American and, and an Asian, when you have those two on films and when they collide and they interact and they talk, mm-hmm. especially if some if another actor is I work on film sets too. Mm. When you see another actor and they're interacting, sometimes you gotta hear a certain way how you say something or, or react or something. And when that happens, you know how the response should be when mm-hmm. you say your lines, when you react, when you deliver an action scene or something. It makes it much more easier. Mm-hmm. So with him not understanding what they were saying or how they were doing, he did a very well job. Mm-hmm. And that's in quite incredible for that because, you know, there's movies I've watched and reviewed and so forth and discussed with other people. What was the most recent one? We did. We did. We did. On the bottom shelf. Oh, The Meg. The Meg. You yes. had an Asian actress and you had the Brit, um, Jason Statham, um, where their interaction wasn't really that well, even though they were all speaking English or sort of English, mm-hmm. whatever. And then you have this one who one only only one is speaking English. And maybe the translator for the director and so forth. Mm-hmm. The rest are Japanese. So, mm-hmm. yeah, bravo for him. Bravo mm-hmm. to Nick Adams. Why he didn't went further in his career, I don't know. Because he had the looks. He had the sound. He died. He was a good actor. Huh? He died. Oh, wow. Thanks. Because I think we're all in here to die anyhow. Sometime, yeah, well, yeah, soon, well, sometime uh, whenever. Yeah, he died two years. At like a, Well, maybe not two years. He died a couple, within a couple years of this. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know it was so recent. Yeah, I thought and, it was. Yeah, and there's debate over whether or not it was suicide or not. Oh, They're thinking it was either sad. some sort of a drug overdose or it was a suicide. Oh, that's, that's bleeding sad. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's yeah. very tragic. But yeah, he he definitely had it. I, Leonard Malton called him basically poor man's James Dean. But... <laughs> I don't know saying too much about James Dean. I mean, okay. Well, James Dean only made three movies. <laughs> Although Mr. Adams was in one of those movies with him. He was in Rebel Without a Cause. Yes, he was. I love that movie. I yeah. actually do. Which doesn't surprise me because Nick Adams looks like he belongs in a Rebel Without a Cause. <laughs> yeah, he definitely has that look. Yeah, but you know what a lot of people don't know? He was actually nominated for an Oscar. Mr. Adams. No, I did not know that. What what film was he nominated for? Now I'm curious. Yes, it was actually for a little movie called Twilight of Honor. It was for Best Supporting Actor from 1963. I've never even heard of that movie or seen it. I haven't oh either, but somehow I didn't realize that he had actually been nominated for an Oscar, and which is funny because I've heard people complain about his performance in this, and they think he's just—he looks like you know dime store James Dean, but he's trying to say lines like he's Humphrey Bogart, you know, <laughs> talks okay, about uh, a hill of beans and things like that. What people complain about his—you know what? Question: What did you think of his performance in this? I love his performance in this. I okay. really do, and it's—and when you look at it in context, it becomes even more 
fascinating. And and I think like you were talking about earlier, the fact that he was able to work with an entire cast that spoke a completely different language and they all work like his chemistry with Takarada, who played Fuji in this is outstanding. And they had to work basically through a translator to understand which is just uncanny. And Kumi Mizuno actually said, cause she worked, this is the second time she'd actually worked with him. They were in Frankenstein conquers the world together. And she said that she actually didn't need translators to understand what the Americans were saying. She said she could figure it out by their facial expressions. That is a fantastic actor, actress that is like highly sought after on set because I can't tell you how many times I'm on set and someone delivers a line and, and I'm right there like, man, this line's convincing. And then the person who's responding is like, oh, yeah, um, he did murder your brother. It's like, oh, my gosh, can you deliver any more bland than you just did? <laughs> well, who hired you? <laughs> and I'm, just, I'm just a gaffer right there, just you know, setting up the lighting and so forth and looking. And I look, the sound guy is looking at me like this long stare is like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In fact, in both this movie and in Frankenstein Conquers the World, they're they're playing lovers. <laughs> and story has it, depending on who you talk to, when I was doing my <laughs> research for this, there are two versions of the story now. One version of the story that I think was actually the more popular one was that they actually had an affair. <laughs> Because uh, they, they met on the set of Frankenstein Conquers the World, which was in spring, and then they filmed this in the fall. And th- so one story says they had an affair, which eventually led to Nick Adams' wife filing a divorce. And they had two kids together as well. Oh, the so other sweet. story I've heard is that, and this is, comes from Mizuno herself, he was in love with her. And Nick Adams and his wife were having marital issues. She was filing for divorce. She filed for divorce right before they started filming this movie. And then he tried to propose to her when they were making this movie. And she turned him down because she was already engaged. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's, the, that's the awkward love triangle story happening. <laughs> I know I'm way too young. She's way too old. I would propose to her. No, I, I, I don't blame. Uh, I don't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jimmy. We know you wouldn't blame him either. Jimmy's a robot. Who cares? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I don't think he appreciates your tone. <laughs> yeah, you too, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I'm a little more. I've said before, I'm a little more partial to Kiko Waikabayashi, but I understand. I understand they are both lovely, talented women. Let me tell you, because because Kumi Mizuno was one of Honda's favorite actresses <laughs> to yeah. work with, and he said that either one of the big reason why he liked her was that she was. He said she was very good at playing "quote unquote" westernized women. <laughs> yep, that was very ideal for a lot of um, Japanese films, especially like um, Kira Kurosawa. But he loved the westernized version, and you know you had to think about the whole Eastern mindset, the Western mindset how the different films were. And then when you get such magnificent movies, I know we're going a bit off topic. I apologize. Yeah, for that, no, it's fine. Watch, like the seven samurai. Oh, absolutely. Love that film. Beautiful, lovely, grand film. Mm-hmm. It's so westernized and how he was so much mocked and, well, you know, got well, so much it, it, it out it by inspired studios. a lot of imitators all but over so, the world. So many films he's done. So grand. Yeah. I love it. And you know, you got John Fukudo. He did like westernized type, mm-hmm. but his, um, um, the, these movies and so forth and mm-hmm. you know I'd appreciate it because mm-hmm. if it wasn't for these type of movies I, I would have saved my money at the <laughs> whatever video store bin and bought some other $3 movie on VHS but this is one of those movies I got on the $3 dump bin for VHS and you know ever since then if yeah. it wasn't for that I would have never gotten to Godzilla mm. really yeah. Did that you- and my mom's inspiration my mom really told me about these because she grew up ah. watching these on the telly on mm. television and I think you know they come on like oh, what was it called Monster Madness, not Monster Madness. What's the name of that Mon- freaking uh, show? She always told me. Not Monster Madness. Creature Features. Creature Features. Oh, there you go. And these are like midnight movies. So you get to watch mm-hmm. the Universal Monster movies. And I was like, what a time to be alive to watch this on, t- <laughs> on television. Yeah. And all these movies she told me about. And 
as I'm watching it, she's like reliving her childhood. It's like, oh yeah, and this happens to Godzilla. I'm literally looking. It's like, are you gonna spoil the movie for me? It's like it's the same thing. It's Godzilla. It's like, thanks, mom. Okay, appreciate it. <laughs> and so yeah, like um, one of our favorites we watched was the Crab Monster. What was that called? Ever the Sea Monster of the Deep or Godzilla yeah, versus uh, the Sea Monster. We watched. I cannot tell you how many times we watched that one along with this one and Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla. We oh watched yeah, those they- three non-stop and yeah this is one of those top um four godzilla movies we watch all the time and always just reciting lines because again american version so there was that was that dubbed version he said that was not here but in the english one's like you rats you You stinking stinking rats rats!" (laughs) i bust my gut i was like what james cagney all of a sudden yeah you You stinking rats what did you do to her (laughs) (laughs) yeah that one there are so many great jokes to make with this, but it's so fun. It is it's really so fun. By the way, Ashiro Honda and Akira Kurosawa were best friends. Yeah. I think anyone was best friends with Ishiro Honda because he just seemed like from... You seen the documentary, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Okay, I kind of figured you did. I, I'm sorry if you if I didn't know you. I'm, I'm really sure it's like I've got that very first minute. As soon as it came out, I was like, boom. Um, sorry, I'm calling out of work. I'll do something. Do what? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, just watch the documentary and read his book and so forth. Yeah, yeah he just sounded like a lovely person to be around. He, wa- he was, and he he really liked Nick Adams. He said he appreciated his work ethic, his professionalism. He was always very interested in Japanese language and culture, even though his co-stars were telling him co- the completely wrong things. They, they he didn't know a lick of Japanese, so they would tell him goofy things like i ha- i wrote some of these down there was a couple of like yoshi Shuchio played the controller or the commandant if you watch the japanese version he would mm-hmm. teach him goofy things like to an english speaker it would make him sound like a hillbilly <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> and, yeah you know, but then uh, Such- uh, but then he was trying to say one thing but it was him sounding like he was saying i'm hungry which would just confuse people <laughs> But yeah. then he went. But then he got back at Suchia and learned some stuff in Japanese to say to him when they were acting in a scene together. So when he was trying to be the controller of Planet X, he would just randomly say in Japanese, "You're overacting." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his acting was it was okay. I mean, he had that robotic voice, even with the um when you did it. What was the leader's name? What was the leader's name? Well, in, in, in the dub, he's the controller. Yeah, hey, yeah, the controller. That's right. Yeah, because he's what, the what was commandment in Japanese. Yeah, I, I was trying to remember what was the commandment. I, and again, I remember because I'm so used to the American version. So the commandment is like that's pretty drastic. Yeah. So thinking about that, I like controller better. I do. I know commandment has to be some sort of Japanese thing. I do not. It's a military. It's a military rank. A commandant. Is it? Okay, it has to be because, uh, you know, with my father being in the Navy, I've never heard of that. But, you know, American Navy, Japanese Navy, <laughs> sure. Close enough. Um, <laughs> uh, something I did forgot to mention was the beginning of this with the Godzilla March, you know, because I was so used to, again, the American version, you had that B music, um, cheap mm-hmm. sci fi knockoff, you know, like how mm-hmm. it begins with, with the theremin. The, mm-hmm. Yeah, with that. And I, I still just enjoy hearing, even if there's like a different slightly take of the Godzilla's March. I like the Godzilla March. Like, this was, why do away with it? Why, this, why would you do away with that in a Godzilla movie ever? Yeah, this was actually the first time that piece of music was used. This one? Yeah, this was its first appearance. The Monster I, Zero. No, March. wait, I didn't know it was this. What? Yeah, uh, there were some tracks that sound a bit similar that were used as military marches in some previous Godzilla films, but this is the first time that rendering, that uh, version wh- of the piece was ever used. I did not know that. And they took that out of American version. What mm-hmm. the frick were they thinking? Why would you? That's, a, that's Come, I can't. That's so grand. That sounds better yeah. than that B music. Yeah, rubbish. Yeah. Oh, my. Uh, let me Jesus. tell you, compared to some of the other pre- Godzilla films that were released before this, that's nothing. They're, like King Kong versus Godzilla. Universal took out all of Afuka Bay's music except for the weirdo island chant. That was yeah, it. they put the creature from the Black Lagoon. Thing yeah, they music have music for the creature. From, like, yeah, creature from the Black Lagoon. All, every time when it happens, all I think is like, okay, the creature's going to come out. The film's going to turn black and white. <laughs> and because that's one of my favorite Universal monster movies, and especially living in Florida, I know it's hard to feel, you know, understand. Like you sound like you don't sound like you live in Florida, but I do. 
and living here in Florida, Jacksonville, where it was filmed at not too far from me. It's always mm-hmm. cool. Mm-hmm. Go to those places like, yep, this is where it's filmed at. Yep. Still looks like a swamp. <laughs> <laughs> Some things never change. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Yeah. 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 So it's used later in the movie. They didn't take it out when it was used later. Yeah, that is true. That is very true. It just in the beginning, it's like that's a great introduction for the mu- music for yeah. a movie. So yeah, yeah. I'm guessing it's it's just a Saperstein thing. He just, but he he was actually dictating a lot of things about how the movie was made. He liked Shinichi Sekizawa's scripts. He's the screenwriter on this one. I, we talk a lot about Sekizawa on this podcast. You know, we are all of us here at the uh, here are big fans of Sekizawa. And because <laughs> the screenwriters are unsung heroes, especially when it comes to these classic Toho films, they really are. So he liked his scripts, but he also thought that they had fallen into a formula. And he basically said, like, hey, let's break from this formula a bit. So don't do an expositional press conference at the beginning. Do something else. I well, you know since we're talking about sounds and music, you want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? <laughs> 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 that la- the lady guard <laughs> my god every time that thing screeched i still have that from my ch- teenage hood it's like oh this one you know who makes money off this unless i guess today if you're a tiktoker yeah sure <laughs> and he was trying to sell it to an educational toy company i'm like how is this an educational toy how this is you sell that it's just a regular toy company and then i can see like a regular toy company buying this and then marketing it to boys to annoy their parents and their little sisters that's what they're gonna do. it's like hey kids if you want to annoy that phone operator and then when you call the police at 911 that you shouldn't be use this play it on the phone play yeah. the radio play it in the school and play it everywhere and no other living crap out of everyone around you <laughs> do you want to get a noise complaint from all of your neighbors buy this <laughs> oh mommy i gotta buy this <laughs> It's like something Macaulay Culkin would use in Home Alone. <laughs> you know, if Macaulay Culkin had actually used this in Home Alone, those robbers were like, screw this house, let's go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Although I have heard, I need to, I was trying to correspond with my friend G-Man from the Drift Space podcast. I should have right. re-listened to their episode on this movie because he brought it up there. But apparently there were, there was a reason why this was in here uh, I think the idea was that I'm surprised they didn't make that. Maybe they, maybe it was too taboo a thing to bring up, but apparently ideas for something like this were floating around in Japan at the time because it was meant to be something that uh, women in Japan could use to protect themselves from rapists. <laughs> like, if, wow. Okay. That's why it's I called mean, the lady guard. So uh, like they okay. get accosted by a man and say a dark alley, they hit a button, turn that thing on and it just starts screaming. <laughs> and then everybody in a five mile radius is going to know what's going on. <laughs> hmm. Well, they were in Japan. So I kind of figured there'd be three things you do. You scream fire, you throw some money and, and the guy go like, Oh, I mean money. I gotta get the money. Or just like, you know, maybe throw some, octopus on there it's like, oh yeah, eat that <laughs> throw an octopus i'm just saying i'm surprised they didn't try to market it like that because that that actually might have worked but there you go there was some thought put into this the lady guard <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> i don't think any mugger is going to want to continue mugging or doing whatever if he starts hearing that noise i mean it won't make his brain explode like it does to zillions but I don't think he's going to want to do anything. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you imagine a policeman? So the lady's playing that. And the policeman's like, yeah, I wouldn't touch that. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not protecting that person. <laughs> the only thing I'd be worried about would, that, would be that the assailant would find it and then turn it off. So unless it's like a thing where like you, tur- you hit the button to turn on it and it can't turn off. <laughs> it just keeps screaming. <laughs> Stupid energizer batteries, they keep going and going. They keep going. Oh my gosh. But I will say this the foley on that thing is very unique because I have not heard that sound in anything before this, and I have not heard it since, probably because it stabs your eardrums. But <laughs> yeah, this is the thing everybody wants to hear, you know. 
just like you know since we're talking about something dark <laughs> um i kind of liked how the story was going with um you know their exchange for like hey you've got some issues we've got some issues the issues you have is that you still haven't found a cure for cancer we've got an issue we've got a monster we both need some life changes and i kind of like you know what? i like that I, I like how they were going with the you know the tra- the world's tragic decision impact especially when you got like you know Godzilla, which is a creature after their own devices from nuclear power and so forth. Mm-hmm. He just has nuclear reaction ever just walking around dis- mm-hmm. disastrous, and they and it's like we'll get rid of that for you. Why we're getting rid of that for you? We'll also get rid of your cancer. And I'm like, good almighty, this is like win win. So mm-hmm. yeah, I like that. That's well, I would say a, a very well written story and some thought mm-hmm. put into it. I guess maybe essentially we already know later on. But the simplicity, like, hey, um, we're here to t- conquer and take over the world. You know, that's yeah, well, sometimes and, it gets a little too. I mean, yeah, I know. I, I mean, I know they have film. a reason. It's kind of interesting because it begs the question did Ghidorah actually ravage their planet, or was that all part of the ruse, too? They just pretended. What they really want to do is they want to conquer Earth because they need water. Water is scarce Again, on their planet, which is a sense. very which it's a very simple and very understandable reason why you would want to invade somebody. They have a resource that you want or need. Just like for in my summer on the signs. Except the water doesn't kill them. It's a loud noises made by the lady guard, apparently. <laughs> loud noises of a certain frequency. Make their brains explode. I it's just funny. Be, because in space, no one can hear you scream. Ooh, that, it's a very it's very loud in space today. I'm just, just that that's how loud the lady guard is. It can be heard in space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Speaking of how loud that thing was, what they were inside is a soundproof room. No one can hear from the outside. But somehow you come running in, you hear it after. Oh, wait, wait. So it's not soundproof. Hmm. You know, I one of the books I read in preparation for this was Mushroom Clouds and Mushroom Men by Peter H. Brothers. His chapter on this movie is just nothing but well, not nothing. It's like two thirds him just nitpicking the snot out of this movie, thinking he's it's full of more you know, plot holes than there are holes in Swiss cheese. And I'm just like, dude, will you <laughs> stop it? Okay. A movie does not, a story. I should say, does it need to explain every single little detail? You just need the right ones to keep going with what is happening. The only one I'll give him is since you've brought it up, we'll talk about it here a little bit is there are people who write, who I do think rightfully point out. Why are the zillions doing anything that they're doing because <laughs> they've they're already on earth they're already got a you know stuff going on they just show up and say hey here are the monsters here's godzilla and rodan and then they just take them you know so it's like why go through all this trouble and they already raided the gap with the skin tight clothes that's shown the junk yep. in the front of their pants they got it okay <laughs> yeah it, 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 that's they, some they, impressive they leather i'm just saying <laughs> they beat the hipsters out they even got the skinny glasses which doesn't really shade their eyes yeah, but show the their eyeballs. forge glasses and it, <laughs> <laughs> oh my jesus yeah they're like hey look at this it's like with the antenna with the antenna that's just sticking out of our foreheads, like whatever. It's like, why? Why would you put? Who puts foreheads? You know, those antennas right there, stuck right there. Is like, is it going to your brain or something? I'm just trying to figure that. Out. I mean, there's a lot of questions that you you could ask, but I don't think the movie has to explain everything. No, I I, no, I appreciate when the movie doesn't have to explain every single iota of a thing. I'm like, come on, yeah. I don't need everything explained. I don't need to see the reason the explanation of why. He's using his hands uh, while he's talking because I kind of figured that was like a Japanese folklore because many Japanese, when they talk, they use their hands and they do certain mm-hmm. things. Their hands like, I don't understand. It's like, oh, yeah. yeah, it's the way of talking, sort of like when you talk to an Italian talking about pizza yeah, they spaghetti. They're using hands. their hands. I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, Suchia, <laughs> Suchia, Yoshio Suchia was the guy who played the controller and he was known for being very quirky. In fact, he went out of his way in his career at Toho to get the weird parts. He's like, I don't want the normal stuff. I want the weird stuff. So like, Oh, you need somebody to wear a, wear a 
colorful motorcycle helmet and be an alien leader in the Mysterians? Sign me up. Do we need? Do I need to be a guy who's a scientist who's mind controlled by aliens and is constantly trying to fight it? Oh, I'll sign sign me up for that. Battle of outer space. Oh yeah, I'm there. You know. <laughs> oh, you need me to be a weird kind of robotic leader of another you know, malevolent alien race. Oh yeah, I'm totally there. So he liked that was his thing. So like the weird gestures and everything, he came up with those on the spot. He invented the zillion dialect that you hear him speak a couple of times only in yes. the Japanese. It's not in the dub version. They got rid of it That's in the right. dub version. Mm-hmm. And you know, so he came up with that and it was a company. It's supposed to be, it was influenced by, from what I read, French, German, and Kappa language. Hmm. So, and Kappa is a, uh, is a folkloric creature in Japan. I want to, I want to find those people who made those shoes. I want those shoes. <laughs> I want to run I around need to know. Pole, the pole everywhere and just run around and just up Will Ferrell's game up with those shoes. <laughs> I need to know why curly toed shoes are so popular with villains and tokusatsu movies and tokusatsu anything. Well, I guess someone must have stubbed their toe too many times to get to table and I'm like, screw this. We're going to get some cushion padding right here. In fact, you know, we get robbed so much. We don't have nothing to put money in our pockets. We'll put inside the tip of those shoes and let it roll out. When someone has their shoe rolled, that's like, that man's got money. <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps so. But here's an interesting thing. Since we're talking about the Zillions and their plan. I came across a couple of a, a couple of essays actually that talked about this. And I think this is a very interesting cultural difference that you see here. So, you know, I'm guessing you've seen a lot of 1950s American science fiction films, right? Yes. So, yes. it is no secret that they were heavily influenced by the Red Scare. So there was that, you know, the paranoia of a Soviet invasion. So a lot of the aliens are meant to be, you know, they're influenced by that for sure. That particular cultural zeitgeist. Also, aliens in American uh, alien invasion movies, their ill intentions are always very clear. They're just like, they just come in swinging. They don't care. Japanese alien invasion movies are really different. The aliens don't come in swinging. They're trying to be sneaky. They're trying to use subterfuge. They are uh, they are consummate liars, just like the Zillions here. They lie to the humans the entire time, and then they say, oh, guess what, psych? I know that was terribly 90s. We were lying the whole time. This is not the cure for cancer. It's an ultimatum. <laughs> <laughs> and hmm. even the language that they use, they said, Earth will become our colony. You don't hear that kind of language in American science fiction films. No. No, you don't. And that's because it's coming from a very different cultural space. So the essayists that I've looked at have basically made the argument that aliens in uh, particularly, they, they zero in on this movie in particular. They make the argument that these aliens are meant to be stand-ins for Americans because the only country who has ever successfully invaded Japan is America. And give, you know, it was during World War II. And given that this is just two decades after that, most of the people who worked on these movies were either alive during the war, served during the war. So they make the argument that they're basically anti-American allegories. I don't subscribe to that theory. Especially in this movie, it doesn't hold up. No, it would make no sense. I mean, because again, I mean, I know even when they when you put the flag on that um, planet, what was it? Planet you know, X. United Nations, Planet X. You had what's it? United Nations, the first flag. Mm-hmm. You had Japan. It was Japan flag, and America, and then America in the bottom. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, still, I, I don't. I mean, I guess you could see the line of order. But I still wouldn't say it's anti-American. It doesn't feel anti-American. No, at all. I think like because just, it kind of like it's like they wanted us to work beside an American, and yes. American wanted to work beside the Japanese. Yes, to yeah. find a, a conclusion to this. Yeah. Now, because here's my counter argument to that. So you, the flag is one thing. The other one being, how can this be anti-American? The aliens are anti-American when one of the heroes is American. And he's presented as nothing but a good guy. 
His best friend is Japanese. He's in love with now. She's an alien spy, but she looks Japanese. It's a Japanese actress, and no mm-hmm. one bats an eye at it. Yeah, there's just all the stuff that doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. Yeah, and then the other thing is the people in Japan who were not necessarily fond of how America had treated them at the end of the war, and they felt like America was kind of throwing its weight around and kind of trying to tell them what to do because you know, the Vietnam War was going on at this time, and um, the United States was desperate to have allies in that area. Japan was their go-to ally, but Japan didn't want to be involved in the war. They were trying to maintain a sense, of, you know, trying to maintain some neutrality there. And, you know, just a few years before this, the treaty that the Americans and the Japanese signed after the war had been renewed. And there was a lot of controversy about that. I talked about that in some previous episodes. I think my Mothra 61 episode, I went into that. So there was some tension there, but the majority of people in Japan actually liked the United States. The people who worked on this movie liked Americans and liked the United States, or else I don't think that they would have been nearly as positive, like I said, with the flag and how Nick Adams and Glenn are presented in this movie. Yeah, I mean, I don't see it, so... Yeah, I'm not really too much of a fan when for theories. I mean, yeah, I guess it's fun to read or hear others, but... I'm, I guess I've just never been that person. Like, yeah. I know it's a big thing even today with Marvel's like, hey, you got all these fan theories. Like, screw the fan theories. I'm here to watch yeah. a movie. Well, and it, every movie I watch, am I being entertained? That's why I ask. Mm-hmm. Almost, even I ask that when I do my reviews with my other co hosts in the Bottom Shelf podcast. My main thing is, am I being entertained? Am I be, was I entertained? Yes. Was the, the, the something that I enjoyed? It could be a yes or a no, you know. And it is had it is all oh, make me think about anything you know. There's all kinds of but the whole theories because I know some people love theories. One of my co-hosts loves loves theories. I'm like it doesn't mean a thing because I'm here to watch the movie what it represents unless it's projecting theories. This movie did not have anything projecting any kind of theory of any sort. So whatever. Yeah, yeah I would agree with you there. I think it it's definitely. I do think that the Japanese experience informs what's happening here. Just like I said, with American invasion films from the fifties influenced by the red scare, but that doesn't mean all of the, uh, the aliens in those movies, you know, invasion of the body snatchers. It doesn't mean those pod people are secret Soviets or something like that. It's not all that one one was actually, that one actually was written by that. Mm -hmm. The, The whole, the whole point of that was bringing the allegory. And that actually makes sense. I mean, it's, it's one of those that's the type of movie you could watch either for its allegory for what it was doing mm-hmm. or you could watch it as you know an entertainment source and that's again good writers when a mm-hmm. good writer can do that you know watch the movie and never think about it and then watch it again and then read what the what the writer wrote down and why he wrote it's like oh my goodness because he even explained why he wrote it's like that's great writing you made a good allegory you made a good story that's how you do storytelling mm-hmm Sometimes story te- not all storytelling is needed, but you know that's how you know if it's a good you know writer. And mm-hmm. this one was a good writer for you know it's um entertainment factor. Mm-hmm. It had this Japanese culture, which you know all these Japanese films, most good ones, or most of them will always have like those things that I always see in every other film. Is like there's family, there's trust, there's honor. Those are the key points that's always driving in every Japanese movie. All these Godzilla movies, Gojira movies, whatever you want mm-hmm. to say it like. Same thing when I watch the Akira Kurosawa, those three topics are always brought in every single one of those movies. There's always a, there's some important factors you sit from the Eastern, Western side of filming. You see the same thing with India, again, mm-hmm. Eastern. You get the family, trust and honor, those things. And, mm-hmm. you know, I like it when that movie has a certain style and they keep to that, but they don't mind being daring to do something different. Mm-hmm. This one, yeah, you know, and- again, it's still, still not that westernized daring to just like mm-hmm. do something a little different. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, if we watch in the American way, it's like it's just another silly monster movie. But that's one of the things I appreciate about like watching the Japanese side is like, hey, there's a little bit more topic. There's a little more dialogue. There's mm-hmm. something different that they pose that the other one wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I just think that it's just interesting to see how they approach it differently. And I think that's really all it is. It's not meant to be this one to one comparison. It's just this is how these different cultures, how they perceive the outsider, the other, the invader, that sort of a thing. I mean, like if you read the, you know, the original alien invasion story, war of the worlds, 
you know, that was written by H.G. Wells, and it comes from a very British sort of standpoint. Yes. You know? So, you know, it's I think it's actually educational. So you can kind of see how different countries, different cultures have experienced that and how they you know, how they see it and how they deal with it. So Japanese alien invasion movies, it's not a straight invasion. It's a bunch of aliens who show up say, saying, hey, we bring you glad tidings. We're actually a bunch of liars. But when we <laughs> but when we've got you where we want you, then we strike. Whereas, like I said, in American inv- alien invasion movies, they just show up and they just start. They blow up the White House. <laughs> First thing, you know. <laughs> we don't know why we won't blow up the White House. It just looks so white standing there on the grass. We gotta blow it up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So there's no question about it. It's just like bam, ill intent. Got it. All right, blow them up. You know. <laughs> But which is interesting because Shiro Honda was usually you know, we talked about how what a you know what a wonderful man he was how he, he was very much an optimist and you know he's very humanistic and one of the things that you'll see as a through line especially in his Tokusatsu movies is the concept of the brotherhood of man about how you know we're all one human race we all may look different we may talk different or whatever but we're all human beings what's interesting is that you kind of get the cynical inverse of that here where you know in previous movies if someone was proclaiming peace and brotherhood it was you know it was a good thing but here we have people promising peace and brotherhood and it's a bunch of lies yeah you know what also were you saying about looking at things differently i was also thinking about how different this godzilla looked too yeah, they did modify the suit here. They did. Yeah. They, I mean, he doesn't look like the terrifying monster in this one. No. The last time he they Nothing had that was... Even those... Like, I know, even when I just brought it back up again, sorry, the intense no, technology right. and the aliens, that didn't look terrifying. That just made me bust up laughing every time I saw <laughs> it. Maybe the best design that came out with their skin-tight pants and bulging <laughs> areas. <laughs> But yeah, this, I mean, this guy's had like bulging eyes, like round eyes. His eyes almost look like Rodney Dangerfield. It was like, <laughs> hey. I get no respect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no uh, respect, nothing. Not even Jimmy here. I, um, <laughs> yeah, you say it. Oh, man. Stop dissing my guests. I thought you got over that habit. Uh, but, but yeah, well, uh, did you like how the, the eyes could move in the suit? Yes. The eyes moved in this one. Yep. I think even Rodan's eyes moved in this one. Mm-hmm. Rodan, sorry, I always, yeah, yeah. I always say it both ways. Oh, right I don't on, know why or, I still do that. Right on, and Rodan. And, <laughs> yeah, Rodan is actually one of my favorites for the um, other um, Godzilla creatures on the Monster Island. Oh, well, uh, we'll have I to. Love, I'll have, I'll have I to love go Rodan. take you to. I'll have to take you to go see Rodan after we're done here. <laughs> okay, that sounds lovely. I, I would love uh, as uh, long as it isn't like. Did that yeah. wing flap and blow me away? Then yeah, oh back yeah. See again. Well, or, or you know, like drop molten lava on you. You know, shoot a heat beam at you. You know, don't worry. <laughs> Eat you like okay, a dolphin. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> not yet. Not, not yet, a fan not of Angurus. Yeah. Not a fan of Angurus. I would never oh. have been for some odd reason. Oh. I mean, yeah, it's a nice addition, but I just never was a fan of Angurus or what was the other one? I, I just I never Geigen. Geigen. It was like, yeah, I was like, yeah. Uh, yeah, but whatever. What, what did you think of Rodan in this? I liked. Now, it just felt like I wish there was a bit more with him because it just felt like they had to throw another monster inside. I mean, mm-hmm. I I get it because, I, I mean, we've seen um, Godzilla before. I think we've, see, we've seen, or I've seen, I don't know, um, King Ghidorah. Mm-hmm. Just this time, it's like, oh, yeah, his monster's zero. And I was like, it always kept throwing me off every single time. Mm-hmm. No, just say his name right or something. Well, and everything kept... has a number on planet. Yeah, X. that's right. Everything has a number, just like um, what the states tell me here in my social security. You're a number. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, I, all of us it's, uh, to somebody are just a number. <laughs> yeah, some a little, <laughs> little bit higher than more. Yes, Jimmy, I know that was kind of dark. <laughs> now this is one thing i do know about the film i think the intention was to have mothra but they didn't yep. put mothra here 
Yeah, and they didn't. Uh, she was in the previous. She was in the previous film. There are rumors that at one point she was in an early draft of the script. Some people say that she was cut for budget. I think more likely. I'm with my friend John LeMay on this. I think more likely it was because they just couldn't figure out how to get her in there and make her make sense in the story. Yeah. I mean, Mothra is one of my favorites oh. on Kaiju. I love Mothra inside of the Godzilla films. I always loved the whole magical mystery and everything else about it. And I was like, oh, with the twins and so forth. It's like, it just works. It's just a great... Mm-hmm. But they need more Mothra movies and not that stupid trilogy they did in the 90s. I, uh, well, I, I was going to say, maybe, I'm I was gonna say, maybe I should introduce you to my pseudo sister, but then you diss that trilogy. That might upset her. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, it's, um, I guess you did it for a paycheck. I guess I would too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I kind of wish Mothra was probably, but then again, you know, if you're using Rodan, at least use a bit more Rodan inside yeah. of this. But, yeah. you know, Rodan it's a Godzilla needs, film, so. Rodan sure. needs more love. I really yeah. do think so. I do think I think Rodan deserves more love. He's only ever had one solo movie. One freaking solo film. That's all you can think of. Seriously, you can't do a single film by himself. That's like what, all these other freaking movies they keep doing. It's like I mentioned this before on my channel. It's like you've got the whole Batman world, but every single time you do a stinking Batman movie, you always get a Joker as your villain. <laughs> Please, for the love, just stop. Joker's not the only villain. Use the other characters. Use, you know, do something different. <laughs> Don't even use Batman. Just use Batman, Bruce Wayne aside. Just like Godzilla. I mean, yeah, you got Godzilla as the main. That's grand. I love Godzilla. I love, I love the whole, you know, but sometimes throw me some other monsters. Let me see the other part of Monster Island. I mean, yeah. yeah I, don't know. I mean, th- that's me. why we diversify here on the film vault i mean yes as i have said before godzilla is good for business which is why we're doing a whole sub-series on godzilla films but this year we're talking about other things i started i launched the show talking about king kong and then i did gamera one year because the board man and then you know this year we're doing american kaiju films we're not following a franchise we're looking at Movies produced in a you know in the United States, giant monster movies across different times. So you know yeah. we, we started in the twenties, went to the forties, the fifties. Now we're in the the twenty teens, twenty tens. I don't know how you're supposed to say it, but <laughs> yeah. So you know we diversify here because there's I'm just talking about for to whole studios for to- whole studios as itself. Yeah, I mean I know it's a fall. I know the fallback is always to use that, but you know there's certain studios like they just they just know where the money's at, and that's all they. Yeah. But. Well, and g- to talk about Rodan in this, it, I know some people have said that Rodan kind of gets relegated to just being Godzilla's sidekick in this. Yes. I kind of get that, but you also you know what else you get in this that you don't get in at least in any Showa era film, you get menacing rodan again because when he's controlled by the zillions he's a destructive creature again yes which he didn't really have i mean he was he didn't have his face turn you know until later on in the previous movie but you get to see him actually doing the sort of stuff that he did in his original solo film Mm -hmm. that is true so you get to see him fighting the military and creating windstorms and leveling buildings with it and Fun stuff like that. So it's a little bit of a return to form. Yeah. And you also get to see when you choke an alien, they just stick their tongue out like secure on concert. <laughs> well, his brain was also exploding because of the lady guard. <laughs> yeah. Somehow that controls his tongue right there. Sticking out like <laughs> look, <laughs> look like, what was it? The, the tongue from what was that on the Kung Pao into the show? Like, <laughs> oh, God. Oh, boy, why do you have to like that? It's oh, me. Why do you have to? <laughs> Why do you have to mention that? That movie hurts. <laughs> <laughs> why? Oh, that's why I do. I hurt people. I'm an angry uh, person. I Kevin, hate everybody. Do you want to be back on the show or not? I just, <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> why? This is what I do. Shut your mouth, sir. Don't you get into this either. Oh. See what I put up with anyway. Oh, my gosh. Cheeky bugger. Uh, uh. But hey, you know what's also fascinating? We're talking about the monsters. Did you know that this has the least amount of monster footage 
of any Godzilla film? Yes, I discovered that today when I was watching it. And I was thinking, like, there's not as many Godzilla fights. I'm not, I mean, I wasn't complaining about it. I actually enjoyed, like I said, the story. I liked how the story was going. But I was watching it with my niece. And before I watched it with you, sorry. But I, I watched it with my niece. And she has a Godzilla toy that I gave her for her own birthday and so forth. And she's holding on to it. And I'm right there watching. It's like, I seen how she would, because she's young, she's four. She's right there like, mm-hmm. where's Godzilla? And I'm thinking like, you know what? Good point. Where is Godzilla on this? <laughs> Where is my monster fights? And I'm thinking about it like, because like, I, I just didn't see him that much. Like, what was it? Um, the sea monster. I saw mm-hmm. Godzilla so many freaking times. I've seen so many. I think I've seen him more in the original Godzilla because that was one of the first things. Like, mm-hmm. it didn't take long to show the monster. Like, here, here's Kaiju. Like, oh, wow. Mm-hmm. This is different for, for a monster film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even for black and white. But yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, it was just the, was just the only Godzilla that has the least amount of time. It is. He, other than, Godzilla, other than the American one they did recently yeah. with Gareth Edwards. <laughs> That's like, what, seven minutes? Here you go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> in this movie, five minutes and 43 seconds just for Godzilla. Okay. Yeah. The I mean, least it, of any uh, of anyone. I'm trying to see. Wait, this is less than the Gareth Edwards one. Yes. But Gareth Edwards was like two and a half hours or two hours and 15 minutes. So this was like, yeah. a, well, it was like just like an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, I'm trying to so, see. Yeah, this, this one still was more than that one. We kind of look at time. I'm trying to see here. if Godzilla. I'm trying to see if the 2014 movie is in this. Oh, yeah, it is. Nine minutes and 56 seconds. Yeah, I guess when you kind of time it off, this is still a bit more when you do T- timing per minute second and so forth still mm-hmm. Huh. Mm-hmm. Hmm. yeah so this is the least the one with the most right now the current record holder is godzilla versus mecha godzilla 2 26 yeah. minutes uh, yeah. and 56 seconds yeah pretty much like what was it godzilla 2000 or godzilla, godzilla and then 2000 is second on the list yeah he was in that movie the entire time and i was like loving it when it came in the theater mm-hmm. i was like yes monster fight <laughs> but yeah it, but all together that's just godzilla five you know five minutes 40 some seconds but all together i think there's only 11 minutes of monster footage between the three of them it's part because it costs so much money to make the eye rolls like hey, can we make the eye roll how much that cost it costs a million dollars okay let's cut the budget <laughs> bring those actors back <laughs> <laughs> so like i said 11 minutes total between okay. all of the monsters, or between all three of them. Hmm. So that should tell you something. This movie is loved in the yes. Kaiju and Godzilla fandom. And for all of those people who want to act like, you know, like with Garrett Edwards' film, it's like, you've done it with Godzilla. And I was like, do you like Monster Zero? I love Monster Zero. Do you realize he's Godzilla's in it for five minutes and 40 some seconds? And you love it, right? Why do you uh, let me tell you why you love it? It's because the story is good. The acting is good. <laughs> you know, it's, it's doing all good. these other things right. Yeah, because you also got on um, like that's why you have film editors. And when they, when they edit the film, they know a certain amount of film. And they're like, hey, this scene works. It's great. It's visual. But why are we lingering on the shot for five minutes, seven minutes? Do we really need the seven minutes or should we just cut this down? for time's sake and just, you know, continue with the story, you know, let it keep going because it's just, again, the Western side from the Eastern side, Eastern mm-hmm. side, you make it lengthy. Westernized, you're like, hey, scene ends, boom, next scene. Okay, scene ends, boom, next scene. I don't want to see the same cloud on a French film for five minutes. You're like, that was so visual and artistic. Yes. I just got so much in my mind. It's like, then go outside and go look at the clouds. <laughs> well, <Yes>. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, I forgot to bring this up. When uh, Yoshio Shuchia was talking with, we were talking about how you know, Nick Adams didn't know any Japanese and then he learned a little bit that just made him sound like a dork. He was talking with Yoshio Shuchia and he asked, because he knew he in the Japanese version he was going to get dubbed over. So he asked Tsuchiya if they could get Toshiro Mifune, the great Toshiro Mifune, to dub him. And he said, sure, if you can get Henry Fonda to dub me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah good luck i don't think henry fonda was not a voice actor for anything yeah so uh, henry he like, fonda as the controller of planet x doing that voice oh man yeah that's the time when i'm thinking about like when you do something like that it's like hey we got americans we got japanese like if we're using one let's use another one for the voice controller or let's use a russian or someone <laughs> some, someone 
I forget. Oh, no. Actually, the guy who did the dub for Yoshio Shuchia was a guy named Marvin Miller. He was the voice of Robbie the Robot. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Didn't know. And the guy who voiced... Oh, I forget his name. So look that up, Jimmy, and put it in your blog. But the guy who dubbed over Nick Adams for the Japanese cut of this movie was the guy who originally did the voice of Lupin the Third. I like Lupin the Third. I introduced a friend of mine to that because I, I remember watching one of those movies earlier. And there was a new one. What was it, that was called just Lupin the Third, the recent one, the CGI one. I haven't seen that it's one yet. I watch it. I'm, I'm, I know uh, this is this is Monster Island. We talk about monster films. So I just feel like just saying this. Like, no, hey, no, you got to watch. Fine. It's really like a great storytelling. Okay, great edits. I love Castle Very well Ostro, So, <laughs> yeah, definitely worth watching. Seriously. All right, that's or, good actually, to know. worth owning. Actually, in my opinion, ah, it's worth owning. Good to know. Good to know. But we have to talk about this. People would would send me angry letters if we got through this whole episode, this whole discussion, and we didn't bring up the most famous part of the Dag movie, even more famous than Ghidorah and the Zillions or Exites. Stuart Goldberg the, calls them the Exites. The dance. Out? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that was like like the biggest debate. I remember I had it with a friend of mine, and uh, I'll say his name's Kurt. I don't care, Jonathan, and he was like, just like. That's not a dance. Like, that was a dance. Like, that was not a victory dance. That's a victory dance. That was a dance. That was a Godzilla dance. Kind of like a little Russian, but, you know, it's it's Godzilla dance. I forgot yeah, what this it, was from. This was, You know where it's from, right? I, yeah, I do. It's called the Shie dance. It was from a manga. <laughs> it's from a manga called uh, Matsukun. It was, uh, it was something that the character in that, and you can look it up. You can find images of the character from the manga doing it. And it was just the popular thing to do at that moment in Japanese pop culture. And it was something that I think it was, I think it was Yoshio Shuchiya suggested it to A.G. Tsuburaya, the special effects guy. And he thought, that's a great idea. Everyone else hated it. <laughs> Honda hated it. And Nakajima, the suit actor, hated it. They're like, no, but they did Honda didn't get his way, and it went in there, and Honda said that was a disgrace. He hated it. I could see, I could understand why he says the the disgrace. I could see why future people say it's a disgrace, but you know what? It's cheeky. It's fun. Whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's not something that Godzilla would actually do because then it just like complete. I mean, all this is really unrealistic, and I guess from a certain point of view, but going (laughs) that far... It's like, okay, now you've taken it way too yeah, far. I think it's this movie, I think, marked the moment when Godzilla was shifting from like horror to fun. Well, yeah, th- well, not, not, not necessarily, but I think it was shifting from being like artsy prestige movie to pop culture. Yeah, this was pure pop culture. Yeah. I mean, I mean what and, was and when you get to the seventies, it's straight up just it's straight up pop culture. Like the pop culture influence in the seventies Godzilla films is even stronger. Come on, you get the hippies from the Hedora. Okay, yeah. come on. The black slime, and he's like slinging around the ground with his tail. Come on, seriously? That was like, you know, this is like, whatever. <laughs> I didn't mind. I've always wished, though, with this one, that they've always, I, they they won't do it. I wish to God when they make a proper Godzilla game other than when I got my GameCube, <laughs> the Short of Monstrous Melee, that they would actually just let him do some sort of victory dance when he beats one of the monsters. There was a PS4, there was a PS4 game where you could unlock that as a move and it's the most powerful move in the game. Wait, was that the, was that the most boring, slowest Godzilla ever yep. for a game? Yep. Yeah, of course. That's why I, I yep. you know, a friend of mine, let me borrow that. I play as a, I can't, I can't, I, I don't want this in my collection. Forget it. It's he moves way too slow. I can't take it. I'm losing my mind. Now it's like one of the most expensive games. Like I should have just kept that for you. I kind of wish I had picked it up when I had the chance. Yeah, I had I had a chance to like hold on to it, but I just let it go. It's like I'm sorry, it was so boring. But I would. I'm sorry. I'm that person. If someone gave it to me, I, it's not that I would hold on to it. I would turn around and sell it for the high dollar. It's like you know, it was boring enough for me, anyways. Here you go. I want some money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Also, this was the last movie. This will, this might blow your mind a little bit, Kevin. This was the last time a Godzilla movie was made by the Tanaka, Honda, Subaraya, Sekizawa, Afuka Bay team. 
going forward, not all of them worked on a Godzilla movie together. None of them. They w- None of they them? all worked on Godzilla films, but this was the last time all of them they worked, worked together. on something together. Oh, okay. I'm gonna say like that's no, that's not true. They worked on future. Okay, no, I didn't. Okay, I just didn't think about that. Now, yeah, yeah, because huh. Tanaka was the producer. He produced all the Godzilla yes. films. Uh, Honda directed a couple more Godzilla films yeah, after did. this. Super Raya did work kind of on a couple more Godzilla films, but his priorities were shifting to his television productions like Ultraman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sekizawa wrote some more scripts after this, for sure, but not all of them. And Afukabe did compose a few more times, but having all five of them together, this was the last time all five of them worked on it together. Okay. Yeah. Did not know that at all. Wow. Yeah. That's that's quite that's probably another reason why the story works so well in this film. Yeah, I would say so. Had to be. Yeah. Maybe that's why they had Let's Go Zuzzi. You know what? This is the end. This is it. We're not going to do anymore. <laughs> well, this yeah. Is they were. This was a point where they thought every Godzilla movie they made was going to be the last one. That is true. Yeah, because they're yeah. like, how much longer are we going to keep doing this? <laughs> yeah, this is it. This is it. Just like how everyone thought with another Power Rangers episode. This is it. This is the last one. Screw it. We're done. <laughs> uh, that's one of my other podcasts. I <laughs> oh, I should have brought this up. Uh, the whole aversion to uh, to loud noise. I'm just looking through my notes and seeing what's interesting to bring up. <laughs> This is relevant for uh, for you in the bottom shelf. The you know, aversion to sound comes back in a couple of movies you've had in the on the bottom uh-huh. shelf. Yeah. Uh huh. What? Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. And your favorite Mars Attacks. <laughs> Why? Screw that movie. <laughs> Screw that movie. I'm just saying. I like Mars back. Attack. I, I love Mars Attacks as the playing game. I mean, on um, the game I have. I love Mars Attacks from the collecting trading cards. I love the design. I like the looks. I like it. Just that movie. Oh, man. That is, that is one not my least favorite Tim Burton, but it comes pretty freaking low on the bar. Well, and you know what else is kind of interesting? The, What's that? The zillions get to plan two. Good thing they didn't get to nine. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Just saying. Mm. They could it could have gotten that. Also, uh, Kumi Mizuno and Nick Adams, they are so very well known. Their chemistry in this is is inc- is great. Their relationship is one of the most memorable things in this movie. But guess what? They only have three scenes together. You know what? I guess I didn't think about it until now you mentioned it. It's like they didn't have that many scenes together, but you know, it just it felt real. It's it worked. Again, it worked because you didn't need to have that many scenes because it just it just worked. Mm-hmm. There's sometimes certain movies they don't have that many scenes. Like I was convinced it was long enough for this one. It was it worked. Yeah. It worked fine. I mean, one of my favorite movies in the world is Star Trek Two, and what's nutty about Star Trek Two is William Shatner, yeah, yeah. as Kirk and yeah. Ricardo Montalban as Khan. They never have a scene together. The most no. they have is that they talk to each other on the view screen. That's it. Again, good story writing. When you have good story writing, good edits, you can accomplish almost anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, Honda and his family were invited to Nick Adams' house for a farewell party before he went back to America. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, it was very sweet of him. And, I like that. Mm-hmm. And Keiko Sawai, who played the girlfriend. We didn't talk about uh, Akira Kubo playing the nerdy inventor who comes up with the lady guard. <laughs> It yeah, the world's the most world. annoying sound there. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. We need to talk about. Yeah, I, but, he played in other Godzilla movies. Oh, he's been in several. He was in Rodan. He, and, I was say like, I know him from this. this uh, he was in Son one, of Godzilla. Others. Son of God. Oh my god, uh, that one. Yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the little potato. We, we know about the <laughs> little potato. But no, uh, the girlfriend was played by Keiko Sawai. She was a newcomer, mm-hmm. and Honda really liked her. Uh, yeah, she played another one. That, Mm-hmm. I know she played another. What was the other? That was the next one, right? Uh, I believe so. And she was in a drama, uh, a drama for Honda the next year as well, called uh, I think it was. I can't remember what I can't remember what it was called now suddenly. But she was in. A, look that up, Jimmy. But what's interesting is she was playing a bit of an atypical Japanese woman in this. 
you know, she wasn't just being all demure and everything. And Honda told her when they were working on this, he's like, you are a gentle and quiet type, but your character is propping up a weak guy and giving him a kick in the butt. So you must be assertive. <laughs> yeah, I liked his role. I, I, I know I didn't mention much about him, but I liked his role. I loved I liked how he was nerdy, but it wasn't like overly nerdy. Like everything had, it was just like he had a focus. Mm-hmm. He knew what he liked. And I liked in this version when he met, when he mentioned like, Oh, girlfriend or something like that. He's mm-hmm. like, yeah, soon she'd be my wife. And it's like, see, there's already like an intention mm-hmm. that, Hey, I'm not just in this for like a boyfriend, girlfriend, short term relationship. I was like, I have a future and I mm-hmm. know I want to be here. Do you want mm-hmm. And then my spouse with her. Yeah. And then the Takarada is playing Fuji and that's her brother and he doesn't approve of the relationship. That was actually a very Japanese thing. I found out it's not a custom that's practiced as much as it used to be, but it was a very big deal for older siblings to give approval to the fiancés for younger siblings, which is what they were trying to do here. (laughs) I have learned this for the past couple of years when I've been, some Japanese friends of mine, it's like a thing. So here, like, you know, not only the parents approve, it's, it's, I mean, I guess not as much, but there's still, you have that type of um, sibling type of rivalry. Like they all, you know, just a small family. Oh, there's only three, but they still like, it's like, I don't approve of them now here in America. I was like, dude, man, date them all, marry them all, whatever. It's like, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's they a whole, still have that same culture. Yeah. yeah that's different. a whole thing unto itself, which I've talked about in past episodes. <laughs> I stand corrected going through my notes. Surprised Jimmy didn't bring this up. I was wrong. Marvin Miller, the voice of Robbie, the robot, he dubbed Fuji. Kira Takarada, okay. not the controller. I was wrong. Okay. I was wrong. Also the film, when it was released in Germany, was called command from the dark. <laughs> which was intentional oh. <laughs> because that was the title of a German sci-fi novel by a guy named Hans Dominic. And they passed it off as his, of as course his you work. Got, you got a bank on it. You got a bank on those money. Yep. Of like, really guys. But then again, when I was at G fest this year, I found out some very interesting Italian titles <laughs> for Godzilla films. My yeah. personal, f- what, two, a couple of my personal favorites was that Mothra versus Godzilla was called like Wa- uh, Watangi and the Fabulous Empire of Monsters. Sounds like a seventies music band. It does. And then like Godzilla ver- and Godzilla band. versus Megalon was called. What was it called again? Uh, it was called At the Edge of Reality. Of, of course, that just makes so much sense. That sounds like something I would totally bank on right there. <laughs> Sounds like something from the chapter from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> it does. Yeah. What's your, what's your complete thoughts in this movie? I know, is there like an ending thought you have for this film? Because I, I know I... Oh, you got yours? I'm just looking yeah. through. I think uh, the rest of these notes, you know what? rest of these notes, I, I can save these for Jimmy for when he does his follow-up blog. Like I said, there's a lot that we could talk about with this. It's, But to, you know, to give my final thoughts, I think this is quintessential viewing. For yeah. any Godzilla fan, you need to see this. This is also, I think, one of the most accessible Godzilla mm-hmm. films for the uninitiated. Because it has basically everything that you would expect from a Godzilla film. It's got a solid story. It's got great actors, a great cast, solid dubbing. Even the dub is actually pretty good. And, you know, the monster action that you get is high quality. Uh, there yes. is some stock footage in this is one of the I think this is the first Godzilla film that started getting into the stock footage thing, but it's edited in much better compared to what we would get later. Oh yeah. Like I, I liked when they did um the whole um scare to the aliens and everything else. It was just like pictures they use of when there was like a, a revolt happening in the streets where yeah. you just seen like it was a new story. I liked it. I actually liked it. I don't need to see them moving and everything else because this makes it look more cleaner because sometimes you can look at the, when the was a revolt happening from some other Japanese like misconduct or something of a sort, whatever country it is, and you look like that is that looks like some sort of like I don't know, so some sort of like a revolt happening in the streets and people are just pushing aside due to some yeah. Um, well, it, it is also whatever. just it's also just interesting to see that there this movie is actually acknowledging that there are people in the world who will just want to surrender. Whereas if this was like an American movie, you'd be like, everyone's picking a fight. We're not giving up. 
<laughs> we'll fight yeah. to the last man, baby. <laughs> See these colors? These colors don't bleed. <laughs> yeah. Tell basically. Pepe Le Pew he can break this arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. But, you know, but but it, so there was enough people who were like, we'll just surrender to cause a controversy like what you're talking about. But, you know, I'm talking about like stock footage from previous Toho films. Like if you pay attention, you'll see footage from the original yeah. Mothra because it says New Kirk Motors in one mm-hmm. shot. You know, yeah, well, like that, I said, that, the that editing cool is much better. Yeah. Power of editing. Yep. What are your final thoughts? And then, you know, we'll uh, wrap things up. I here. love this movie. I enjoy it. I, you know, I could be like the Godzilla geek nerd. I am. It's like, hey, buy every Godzilla movie. But this is one of those movies that even if you're not a Godzilla person, definitely worth owning this. Because, again, like there's other people who's like, I'm not into Godzilla, whatever, you know, Godzilla's Godzilla. I like the first one and I like one other and that's it. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm not telling you to go buy every Godzilla, but this one definitely worth buying, definitely worth owning. If you can't have access to it, because for some reason, sometimes it's, a- it's hard access for streaming oh, for here. This in the thing States, is you can stream this on, on, e- on everything. <laughs> no, not everything. You can't you can't stream it on um, what was it? I tried looking up. It wasn't on Amazon Prime. No, it wasn't it, um, Vudu, and it's one other platform. But it is on Tubi and it is on YouTube, and it's on HBO Max. Okay, I don't have HBO Max. I, I look at all, the, oh, man. Come on, look at all these movies I have on physical media. So uh, <laughs> streaming is not the first thing I think of, but I think so many people have been asking me. I don't know if they ask you on the podcast, like, "Hey, can I stream this? Where can I stream this?" And I think. All the films that um the Janus films did with Criterion yeah. for the Godzilla has been able to stream on YouTube. So mm-hmm. that's always nice and cool to know. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right, Kevin, that was great. I have to say that <laughs> we had a tremendous time with that and a very efficient discussion. I have to say it's like you're good at this. Yeah, <laughs> you know what you're it's doing. It's almost like I know what I'm doing somehow. I know, right? Yeah, I mean, almost I, my parents I, could I, say the same thing. I mean, try living with a producer who questions whether or not you actually know how to do your job. I mean. <laughs> Oh, knock it off, man. All right. Sometimes I wonder if you know how to do your job. But, Kevin, it's time for a very exciting segment here on the show we like to call the Patreon Shoutouts. Go show like a Travis Alexander. Danny DeMena. Eli Harris. Chris Cook! Bex for Redeemed Otaku! Damon Noise! The Cellcast! Eric Anderson of Nerd Chapel! Uh, Ted Williams! Tofu Okay. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I think I think the Lady Guard Mark II is going to have that for the soundbite there. Oh my gosh. I didn't know the human throat could do that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, 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 my, my capital right now under water breath is um, was, one minute and 34 seconds. I, I was going to say, uh, do, do we do you need a respirator or something right now? No, can you? I'm good. It? OK, OK. Yeah, it's dead enough day. I need okay. all the breath. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah. Yeah. We have a we have a nice gym here on the island. You should check it out. You have a good time. Oh. I definitely should check that out. I'm yeah. not challenging any monster to that. I'm not uh, challenging no, any no, kaiju no, 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 yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, 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 no challenging of kaiju to deadlifting contests and things yeah. like that no, uh, there's things i learned i never ch- i challenged people to i never challenged to a gym uh, never challenged them to like a rap battle i never challenged them to a bar uh, because you know you know what happened when godzilla walked into a bar uh, <laughs> the whole building is destroyed and 39 people are missing and some of them uh, are presumed dead for sure for sure so to let everybody know Next couple of episodes, oh, it's going to be exciting here on Monster Island. We have a bonus episode coming up because we have five Wednesdays in the month of August. So normally we have episodes released on the first, on the second and fourth Wednesdays. Well, we get a bonus this month, and it's on Pacific Rim Uprising. 
I'll be bringing my friend Jack G-Man Hudgens on. He is going to make a valiant defense of the movie because he is one of the maybe 10 people in the world who actually likes it, unironically. So we'll see how good of a case he can make. I bet his mom drops him several times as a baby. Ooh! He can take it. He's a big boy. (laughs) But then... Amerikaiju, our flagship series this season, continues. I'll be bringing on not one, but two guests. Robert and Courtney Kelly, the co-hosts of the Record All Monsters podcast. We're going to be talking about Colossal. Have you seen Colossal, Kevin? Yes, I have Colossal. I've seen Colossal. Yeah, what did you think of Um, Colossal? uh, He didn't look that big in the White House. Wait, what Colossal we're talking about? Oh, wait, wait, the movie, the movie, yeah, Anne Hathaway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anne Hathaway, yeah, I, I, yeah, that movie, yeah. Um, I got thoughts on, but you know, you, you do your thing with yeah. your thoughts and your guests All and right. so forth. And, All right, yeah, well, that'll be interesting because it's a unique one to say the least. And then we get back to some Godzilla Redux with a film that you talked about a little bit today, because apparently you were very fond of this one as well. Perhaps I should have you on again in case my original intended guest can't make it, but Ebra horror of the deep or Godzilla versus the sea monster, whichever title you prefer will be our next one for that sub series. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And I'm hoping some some bowling water, a wee bit of salt, you know, some (laughs) old Bay seasoning. Yeah. We can Mm -hmm. get this thing going. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I'm hoping to have my friends, Joe and Joy Metter on for that one, because interestingly, this is one of two Godzilla films that have appeared on mystery science theater and are basically lost to time because Toho said no ho. (laughs) You can't have those out on DVD because they try putting Godzilla versus Megalon out and Toho yelled at them. Hmm. That's what happens when it's infested with roaches. That's Godzilla versus Gigan, but sure. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> that too. That too. So that's what we got coming up here on the film vault in the next couple of weeks. And now, Kevin, we come to one of the most important segments of the show, shameless self-promotion. So all I'm going to say really quickly is to go check out my spinoff podcast, Henshin Men and the Power Trip. What do you got, Kevin? If you see me in person, just leave me alone. (laughs) (laughs) No, seriously, if you do see me in person and just, you know, just just say something, you know. Yeah, I don't care if you even call me some four-letter word. Just say something. <laughs> <laughs> if that, if not that, you can always come by my YouTube. You see me at the Dapper Man Reviews. I do movie reviews on there. If you don't like to see my face, and you can listen to my lovely voice on a podcast called the Bottom Shelf Podcast, which is ran by Geek Devotions. Mm-hmm. It has some wonderful people, such as Dallas. Mm-hmm. And Branson Boykin and some guy who with a with a J in the beginning of his name. <laughs> and yeah, you get to see hear our thoughts and we take a comedic turn on movie reviews and see how terribly bad they are because some movies have been said they were horrible and sometimes they really are as horrible as they are, no matter how many times you try to convince other people that they're not. Other than that, yeah, you can also follow me on Facebook if you want to see some lovely memes that I create and steal and sometimes, you know, just don't give shout outs to because I'm that I'm petty like that. And on yeah. Instagram. So yeah. just put on the Dapper Man reviews. Yep. The the bottom shelf Instagram is comedic gold. <laughs> um, I thought I was good at hype memes and then I saw yours and I'm like, hmm. Well, technically, yeah. you no know, one's supposed to know who's making those memes from the bottom shelf podcast. But since we're right there, are pointing names and hands. Yeah, yeah. They've I'll said gladly. they've mentioned that you run it on the show. I know. Okay? I, I hate when they do. I, I try to keep it open for everyone, but you know what? He's mentioned several times, like I'm a meme, I'm a meme master, and I know my comedy timing. But then again, they edit a lot of things I say, so I'm not, I'm just kind of curious, like how well is my comedy? <laughs> like maybe i'm not so good i don't know if you, you like hear, it yeah you should hear something 
You should hear the things that I have to edit out, which actually you can if you join MIFE Max on Patreon for just $3, starting at just $3 a month. You get shout outs like we did today. And at the $10 level, you get to hear all the stuff that only the people here on the island get to hear. <laughs> Nobody yeah. else yeah, hears yeah, because, it in the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, because he already edited off my four F bombs in this video. This, he said, I could look forward to that. Yeah, I mean, that's why I have Jet Jaguar around as my dump button. I mean, it's just. <laughs> 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 uh so yeah so you got a lot of stuff going on you're also you've mentioned before you're working actually working on movies which is just so yes. exciting my friend there I is mean, there's two films being th- released to jc films production independent christian film mm-hmm. production oh by the way earlier i said there was no f film sorry you can still start, start <laughs> to patreon i know Anyhow. i know we just have we're just having fun with it because you're everyone's favorite angry irishman we get it <laughs> Uh, I find that I'm sometimes not everyone's favorite. Some sometimes they really do set the right between personal messenger and then block me and say, um, "Learn to you know research and enjoy your life or something." <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, other than that, yeah, I am on some um, short films. There is actually a short film on YouTube called "Trust God." I recommend that you actually watch it. It's a very short film. It's only about twelve minutes, but mm-hmm. it's something I was very proud of because it was my first time actually. You know, there was other films I was first part of but there was a first time i actually was in something yeah i don't say any lines in it but you know it's something i was very fond over and i very much enjoyed shooting down in an orlando area of florida but yeah i'm getting more and more involved in films and you know before you know it you might see me directing a film and <gasps> you're definitely gonna have to check it out Ooh, exciting Exciting. Yeah. If you do, if you it'll be it, too it, late i'm i'm gonna be in GeekCon, but by the time you listen to it hey GeekCon's already passed so yeah hold on. Yeah, I mean, if you make a kaiju movie, you can come on and talk about it. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there's been there's been thoughts, but that's some other time later. And, and I know a guy who can distribute it for you. Oh, hey, I guess we will talk more after this episode. Yeah, we definitely will. We definitely Brilliant. will. And with that, intrepid producer, <laughs> no more lip from it because now you have to. Cue the credits. Thank you for listening to the Monster Island Film Vault, a podcast produced and hosted by Nate Marchand. If you want to join the discussion and be heard on the show, we'd love to hear from you. So email us at feedback at monsterislandfilmvault.com. Our website is monsterislandfilmvault.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Monster Island Film Vault. And on Twitter, where our handle is at the Monster Isla One. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, and TikTok. Follow Jimmy from NASA on Twitter at NASA Jimmy and our many other colorful characters using the links in the show notes. The podcast logo was created by Tyler Souls from TylerDrawsComics.com. Our theme song is Wanderer on the Offensive, live edit by B33J, Serax, Juan Madrano, and Nonsensical Lexus which is a remix of Counterattack, Battle with the Colossus, and The Opened Way, Battle with the Colossus, by Koatani from the video game Shadow of the Colossus. All film and audio clips belong to their respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended or implied. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and or Podchaser to spread the word about the show. You can also support us by joining MIFV Max on Patreon. The Monster Island Film Vault is a Moonlighting Ninjas Media production. Sayonara! Nate Marchand, Personal Journal. When Jimmy and I walked into his garage, I realized I'd forgotten how huge it was. It's as big as several military-grade hangars combined. Several famous aircraft and spacecraft, including the Moonlight SY-3, White Heron, and a War in Space era space fighter, are parked throughout it. And that was just what I could see at that moment. Is the dang thing bigger on the inside? Anyway, we walked past Jimmy's never-ending works in progress, Mechanicong Mark II and Ubermogura, which had winding catwalks ascending around them. So, where's Winter's gift? Or should I say bribe? I have it over here in the side room. I, uh, need to keep it from prying eyes. Oh, top secret stuff, huh? What is it? <laughs> a rebuilt Varabloon? That'll make our so-called resident Go Ranger Raymond happy. Nope. The Gotango? 
I wish. Captain Jinguji still isn't speaking to me. Hmm. Oh, I bet it's the Virassian UFO. Winter would want to tap into your nostalgia. Ooh, close but no cigar, Marchand. Jimmy and I came to the entrance to the side room. Then what is it? Something I thought had been destroyed a long time ago. It might be the rarest piece of history on Earth. And let's see it. The suspense is killing me. You swear not to say anything until I give you a very well-crafted announcement? My lips are sealed with adhesive X. I barely understood that reference. Uh, anyway. Jimmy punched a button on the panel, opening the door, and my jaw dropped seeing what was inside. <gasps> a zillion saucer? <laughs> Stellar, right? Hardy har har. <laughs> Remember how the Exilians had Ghidorah attack the Western Hemisphere during the 65 invasion? This was probably one of the saucers leading that assault. But the Zillions escaped into the future and blew their ships up. Right on, but uh, apparently this one crashed instead of exploding. It was housed in Area 51 after the invasion. Until now. No surprise. But it collected dust there because no one could figure out how to reactivate its computers once it was disconnected from the Exilian network. You mean their pseudo-hive mind? You could say that. That's partly why they were willing to send it to the island. That and Winter probably threw gobs of money at them. Yeah, well, having government contracts gives you a lot of clout. Regardless, this is super cool. I can't wait to tell everyone we have this. Whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. There's, uh, there's something inside that I, uh, I need to show you. And you can't ever tell anyone about this. What are you talking about? Jimmy motioned me to follow him. We walked up the saucer's gangway and entered the ship. The walls were scorched, and debris was strewn throughout the nearly empty interior. The zillions were beyond practical, and the lack of decor and luxury on the ship showcased that despite the extensive damage. Jimmy led me to the bridge-slash-conference room, and then to a side door. Jet had to pry this open because it was magnetically sealed. Once we got in, I understood why. Jimmy pressed a button on the side panel. Lights flickered on. Inside the sparse room were a half dozen pod-like plexiglass beds. All but one of them was smashed and empty. My eyes widened when I saw someone laying in the one intact bed. Holy crap. Is that... Is that... Yeah. An Exilian woman. We walked over to the bed, which was half open. Inside was a sleeping zillion female with perfectly preserved features and an immaculate black and gray uniform. They really are the spitting image of Miss Namikawa. <laughs> I'll say. She dead? No, she's, uh, she's in stasis. Even Exilians need to sleep, I guess. She's Lady Rip Van Winkle. He tried to wake her? A few times, but obviously nothing's worked. I have one last idea, though. What's that? Jimmy pulled his cell phone out of a pocket in his orange jumpsuit. The most obnoxious sound in the world. The zillion woman suddenly sat up and screamed. Ah! Ah! Oh my god! Godzilla! It worked! Where... where am I? Controller, what are your orders? Controller? <gasps> Earthlings! Enemies! Hey, hey, calm down, baby! We're not gonna hurt you! No. You've cut me off from our computers. Re-establish my link to the controller, or be destroyed! Hey, hey, hey! No one's destroying anybody! We can't plug you back in even if we wanted to. How? Why? Newsflash! Your invasion was almost 60 years ago, and you lost. The controller died, and your computers got wrecked. No. No! The Zillion woman fell back onto the bed, her lips quivering as she whispered desperately. Where are you, controller? What are your orders? Where are you, controller? What are your orders? Where are you, Controller? What are your orders? Jimmy took me aside in the corridor. <sighs> now we really can't say anything. 
If word gets out, she'll be arrested and tried as a war criminal. And I'm not even sure the legal action team could get those charges dropped. I know, but, but... If Namikawa could be saved, so can she. That's because she fell in love with your hero. This woman was forcibly cut off from her computerized people. It's like getting an internet addict to quit cold turkey. But it can be done. Do you actually want to help her? Or is her resemblance to your celebrity crush kicking in harder than your war in space PTSD? Y yes, I, I want to help her. <sighs> All right, let's do what we can for her. Jimmy gazed into the stasis room longingly and grinned. <sighs> I sighed nervously. Hang in there, baby. Hang in there. God help me, he's got it bad. End journal entry. <laughs>